In the early days of my Salesforce career, I wasn't very confident in using the Salesforce system. In fact, I was a little bit worried about losing my job. And the reason for that is because I don't use code. However, since I have discovered tools in Salesforce that can help you build out and automate processes with clicks not code, then I've since been able to grow quite a successful Salesforce career and ultimately keep my job. And to be sure that you leave this video with full confidence, we're gonna go through a follow me session where we're gonna build a process from scratch, step by step, and we'll even go through setting up your own developer org. Easy. Let's go. Hey Salesforce friends and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Adam Foyson and I'm an independent Salesforce consultant based in the UK. On this channel, we explore the tools, strategies and best practices to help us live happier and more productive Salesforce lives. So today we're going to look at how you can build out and automate a business process without the need for code. And we're going to do that using the process builder. I've been asked many times in the different roles that I've had and different businesses, how we can make the business more efficient. Sometimes that was a challenge without using code like Apex until the discovery of Process Builder. And I found that I was able to build out and automate some quite complex processes for the business. Now, here's the thing. Even if you just automate a few manual clicks for users, if that task is done many times and across hundreds or thousands of users, then the effects over time can compound. And it's even Einstein himself that was claimed to have once said, that compounding is the most, the powerful, most powerful force, force in the in universe. universe. Okay, but mastering the use of tools like Process Builder has helped me to grow my confidence in the use of Salesforce and subsequently has helped me to grow a relatively successful Salesforce career with increased earning potential. So let's get straight to it. Okay, so here we are. We're gonna go through step-by-step -step building a process in Process Builder. Now, before you do that, uh, so that you can follow me, if you don't have your org already, then you can sign up and get a completely free developer org from Salesforce themselves. Yes, fully loaded with the latest features of Salesforce. And all you need to do is click the link in the description below or go to developer.salesforce.com forward slash sign up. And from there, you'll see a pretty straightforward form. Put in your details, sign me up and then you will get yourself a lovely Salesforce org. And we're going to log into the one that I've got right now. And the first time that you log into an org, you'll probably see lots of messages to help guide you through. So if you've never used it before, it's always really useful to use those steps. Now, let's start building this process. So first thing, we need to find Process Builder. And this quick find section here, you can put process, BU, there we go. It, reduces the results and puts Process Builder there. Great, and it even has a little welcome to Process Builder with some help guides and trailheads and everything like that. But we can skip that because we're gonna go and build it straight away with me on the video. Now, we're gonna do a an example from the trailhead itself. And the scenario is this, if an opportunity is created or updated and it's high value, which we're gonna say is about $250,000 and closed one, then create a draft contract. And then six days after the opportunity closes, create a follow-up task for the account owner. So that's the scenario. Let's have a look at how we build that process out. Now we're gonna call, call this closed one opportunity. I'm gonna test my spelling and I just, press tab there that moved me to this next API name field. And if you're not familiar with this, the first uh, box where you're typing in the name of the process is kind of like the label. And the API name is effectively the backend name that's given to this process. And it's the same with fields. If you have a custom field, you'll have these underscore sections. It won't support spaces. And that will be used in other flows or even externally if you want to query the Salesforce API and call any of these processes. So in the description, of course, make something pretty straightforward. I have copy and pasted something that I typed up earlier. And then we need to select the process starts when. And just like mentioned before, you've got record changes, platform event message is received, and it's invoked by another process. So 
A record changes, obviously pretty straightforward. If someone edits or creates a record, then it will fire that. A platform event message is received is when there is an external or internal custom notification that this platform is looking out for. Uh, an example of this could be a logistics or delivery company. When a delivery has been completed, the message or the event to say that delivery has been completed could be broadcast out. And if this process or Salesforce is tuned into that broadcast, it can then listen and pick up that message and then start a process on the back of it. Uh, you can also invoke this by another process. But for the purposes of this demo, let's have a look at when a record changes. Just a quick little overview of what we've got. You've got some buttons across the top, expand all, collapse all, just in case you've been, uh, you've got lots of actions and you collapse them, you can um, show them all. You can view all processes. So this is to go back to the, uh, something we'll see at the end when we save it. You could, if there's other processes for other objects you've created, you can see them all there. You can clone the process, obviously, allows you to uh, make a copy of this. Uh, and that's where you can create different versions and you can edit the properties of this. So really this takes you back to the original screen that we started on when creating a new process and look, you can create it as a template. So that's a really good way of trying to make it really quick. So when installed from a managed package, subscribers can open a template in Process Builder and clone it as a new process to customize and build upon. So that actually is going back to what I mentioned earlier about the app exchange and the templates that are on there that you can download and use. So there we go. Let's cancel that. Let's start building this process then. So going back to the uh, example or the scenario that we're going to build on, it was if an opportunity is created or updated and it's high value, $250,000 and closed one, then create a draft contract and then six days later, after the opportunity closes, create a follow-up task for the account owner. When we click Add Object, we get this pop-out on the side. Pretty straightforward. We've got the full list of all of the objects, custom or standard out-the-box objects. To save time scrolling through, let's start typing opportunity. Different objects here. We're going to do the opportunity object. And we can start the process when a record is created or when it's created or edited. Now, because we are going to fire, we want this to fire some actions when it goes closed one, the record will probably already be created at that time. In fact, it'll be quite likely. Well, let's click save there. So the next thing to do is to add a criteria, a criteria node as they call it in Salesforce. Uh, let's have a, a name for this, something that's, that's going to describe it. So we want to assess when it's closed one and high value. Okay. And we're going to say, yes, when the conditions are met, we want it to fire the actions. So let's define these conditions. And in this section set conditions, we've got the first one already added. We click in here to say, well, what field do you want to look at? And if we click this drop down, we can see we're already in the opportunity. That's the object that we selected at the beginning. And what we want to do is we first want to assess the stage of the opportunity and if it's closed one or not. So we can either scroll down and look at all of these fields or can start typing. So let's put stage. And you'll see here that it describes what the field is. So the API name is stage name and it's a pick list. So yep, yeah, that's the one I want. I'll click choose. And then we've got an operator. We have standard logic operators, but we want it to only fire when it is exactly the particular pick list value of closed one. Done. That's our first criteria condition set. But we also want to assess when it's high value. So let's add a row. Again, go to the fields. And if I click the drop down, we are looking for the amount field. So if I just start typing amount, there we go. We can see that it's a currency field. Just make sure I've got the right one. Yes. And we, this is where the criteria, you can choose whether it equals 250,000. If you did that, then it would only fire when it's exactly that value. So we want it to actually be when it's greater than or equal to 250,000. You just need to put the number in. You don't need to put the currency symbol. 
And here you'll be able to now see that you can set it so that it will assess when one and two are true. You can set it to or, so one or two, or a custom logic. So really custom logic we can look at in another video when we do more advanced stuff. But it's let's say you've got 10 different conditions and maybe you want to see that you want it to assess when one and two is true or three and four, etc, etc. But for the purpose of this, we want to assess when it's closed one and when the value, the amount value is greater than or equal to 250,000. Now, because I'm in the UK, this is obviously set in pounds, but when your um, currency setting in your org is set to a different value, then you will see the different value there. And we'll see here, do you want to execute the actions only when specified changes are made to the record? We want to select yes. And the reason for that is because we don't want this to be running and assessing every time somebody edits the record. If you do that, it's gonna be quite inefficient in the system. By setting this to true, it's only gonna look at changes to the stage field and the amount field. It's a lot more of an efficient way of looking at things. Let's click save. And now that we've configured our criteria component, we can now create the actions. Uh, the actions that we're gonna be creating first, uh, if we remember the scenario, is to create a draft contract record. So if I go to immediate actions, these are obviously the actions I wanna fire straight away as soon as this turns to true. So it's all visual, really easy to kind of see what's going on there. Um, let's look to the right, we've got action type, and like we say, we want to create a record, a contract, draft contract. Let's put a description there for the action. So, create draft contract, make it as simple as possible, not just for yourself when you come back to this, but for any other uh, people that come after you to help with maintenance of the system. So that's a bit of a best practice. Now, the object. When it says record type, it means which object do you want to create the record for? So let's start typing contract, click, and instead of just creating the record by itself, there, there will be the option, as you can see here, to populate some of those fields straight away. And one of the fields that you, or some of the fields that you'll need to create before you can even create the record are the required fields. And on the contract, the required field here is the account ID. So you can't just create the uh, contract record and have it float around the database. You have to connect it to an account. Now the ID is actually gonna be dynamic. That means that the account ID will change depending on what opportunity I actually clicked on and started this process. So instead of selecting, I wanna type in the ID, we wanna use a field reference. And the reference we're gonna use is the account ID field on the opportunity itself. So it will automatically pull through the correct account. Great. So I can start typing account, and you'll see here that I've got two account ID uh, options in the drop down list. I've got one with a little arrow. So the difference is account ID without an arrow is the field itself. If I click on the one with an arrow, you'll see that this takes me to another dropdown with a load of fields in. And what that basically is, is the lookup. So if the field, which is account is on the opportunity, is a lookup to the account, I can access the fields on the account. I can even go another step down and go to the parent account and look at the fields on there and so on and so forth. So it's really powerful with Process Builder to kind of access any field values that may be in the database that's related. However, we don't want to do that. We just simply want the account ID on the record of the opportunity itself. So we just click the field itself and you'll see there that the type is an ID and it's related to the account ID field. Let's click choose, fantastic. And the final thing we wanna do is select what the status is gonna be. So the status on the draft contract is a pick list. And if we just click here, you can see the different ones are in approval process, activated, or we've got draft. If we select draft, then we've got our draft contract ready to be created. Let's click save. 
And that is our first immediate action. For anyone else that's looking at this, you can see, again, just quickly look at the flow, uh, opportunity. You can click on any of these elements and see what they're doing, the criteria, and then click on the actions and see what the actions are doing. We're creating a contract record, setting the account ID to a field reference, which is the opportunity account ID, so that they are all connected correctly, and the status is gonna be draft. Fantastic. The next thing that this scenario wants us to do is to create a task for the account owner six days after the opportunity has closed one. So to do that, we won't be creating the action to create a new task in immediate actions because we want to wait six days. So this is where we go to the scheduled action section. Now, first let's set the schedule. So when do we want to fire the actions within? So this is kind of like a placeholder, a bucket for any actions to be fired when it meets the scheduled uh, date or time. So we've said on the right here, we've said that we want it for six days. So we can actually type in six and we can even do it by hours if that's the case, which is really useful, but we're gonna do days and we want it to do after we're going to do the, we've got a number of options in the drop down there. We want to do the close date. Now, the options you see in the drop down are basically any date and time fields that are on that record. So we've got created date, last modified date, but again, we just want to do close date. So already you should be getting a bit of inspiration about the different things that you can do or the different things that are possible with all of these tools. So now that schedule has been created, we want to fire an action six days after the close date, let's click add action. And we wanna create a task. So to create a task, you do create a record and let's give this a description. So follow up task, groovy. Let's now go to the object. It's the task object, start typing it in. And just like before, there are some required fields that we need to fill in. Now, going back to the scenario, we want to create this task and assign it to the account owner. So think back about what we've just been doing and how would we do that? So again, if I'm selecting the field and the type ID, I've got these other options, field reference, global constant, we'll look at that another time, uh, or a formula. You could create a formula to, to derive the value. Now, if I just choose ID, that means I'm going to type in the actual ID itself. That can be useful if you've got a very, very specific use case where you need a specific ID to always be captured. But remember, the IDs will change in different orgs. If you were migrating stuff across, you won't always have the same ID. So therefore, 90 something percent of the time, you're going to be using field reference. So let's click that, that means it will be dynamic. And if I click find a field, we can then look at the opportunity. And what did we say? We wanted to get the account owner. So not the owner of the opportunity, the owner of the account. So if I go to the account ID field with the line, it will take me to the account object fields. Now I can see the fields on the account object. I can then go to owner ID. So this is the ID of the um, user profile of the person that's connected as the owner on the account that is related to the opportunity that fired the process. Let's click choose and fight fantastic. We're gonna set the priority. I mean, you can set any of these to whatever you think, but if it's sales, they're gonna think this is a high priority to go and follow this contract up. And we're gonna put status. We've got not started, in progress, completed. Well, it's not gonna be any of these. So we'll just put not started so that when they look at this in a dashboard or report or even their task view on the home screen, they can see uh, the things at the beginning of the day that they have got to do. Let's click save. And there we go. We have just created a process with an opportunity, a criteria to assess, and then fire an immediate action for a draft contract to be created that's connected to the opportunity. And then six days after that close date, we want to send a follow-up task to the account owner to do something, which will probably be close this contract down, get it signed, get the money in, whatever it needs to be. Now, as you can see, you can go down many levels. So if this assessment is true, it will fire these actions. If it's false, it will just skip it. 
and either go right down to stop, as you can see there, that's the end point of this process, or if you want, you can add a new criteria, assess a different set of, uh, of circumstances or, or conditions and fire different actions or whatever it is you want to do. And you can add, if we were to add another criteria and save it, you'd then be able to add another one, another one, and keep going down and down and down. So you can create quite a complex process just by using these simple tools here. Now that we've finished this, we want to deploy it, to activate it in the system so it starts running. And there is an activate button there. There you go, very easy. If we click activate, it says, you sure you wanna do this? Um, and it also says it will deactivate the previous version in the version history. So if you've created, um, if you've already created this before, but you've got a new version, it will just deactivate the other one because we don't want two running at the same time, clearly. Click confirm, and now, that is activated. Now, one little thing to note that when you deploy these processes, you can do it in change sets, which is really useful. But even if you have it active in your developer org, it will deactivate it when it moves it into the next org. So you need to manually activate the processes for them to actually work. So don't expect them to work straight off from deploying uh, the change set. And finally, if we look at the view all properties section, from that button, we can see our process that we've created. And if we toggle this uh, here, we can see that we've got one version, just the one that we've created. Give a description that we put there, the object that it's connected to, last modified date, and the fact that it's active. And if we click into that again, and we do clone, you'll see here that we're able to copy that. Maybe we keep the name, click save this is how we can then create a different version if i pretend that i've made a change there so let's click create and say in approval process let's click save and activate yes we want to deactivate any active ones because this is now our primary process and if we go to view all processes here's the one that we've been working on and we've got version one the first one version two the one we've just edited and that is the active one so there's version control now if you like this video or found it useful hopefully you feel confident now in using process builder and you want to know more about maybe the difference between workflow process builder and flows to understand which one you should be using in scenarios or you want to follow me in building your very own first flow in flow designer then click to watch these videos here and finally don't forget to subscribe and click the notifications button so that you can get more from this channel like this every week see you there and may the salesforce be with you.